Can you all hear me? Too loud? Too low? Just right? Just right. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today, and uh, I'm really honored to be in this MGM auditorium and in this building and on this campus, which I'll have a little more to say at the end of the talk. But right now, we're going to talk about cancer, which has been called by some the emperor of all maladies. Now, this talk is going to follow Roseman's mastery learning model, in which, see, Roseman has a very unique learning approach, an educational approach to teaching and learning. They use sometimes team-based learning, where students are given a reading assignment, and they, they participate as teams. And that's followed, in a sense, with a flip classroom. Students, in a sense, become like teachers, and they learn themselves, and then they come to class. But before that, they get a pre-class reading assignment. And then that's followed by a pretest, and then didactic discussions, and then finally, the concept of remediation. So whereas most colleges of medicine and most colleges, you know, grade A, B, C, D, and E, not at Roseman. Roseman may initially give a test, but those students who don't come up to the 90th percentile or more, they are remediated. So the idea is everybody eventually comes up to the same level of knowledge. And that's called the mastery learning model. And we're going to use a modification of that in, in, in this next hour and a half. Now, I really didn't know who was going to come today. And so I couldn't hand out a pre-class reading assignment. But I do want to ask you one question. How many of you have been touched in one form or another by the disease cancer? Just as I thought. You don't need a pre-reading assignment. You've been all to the school of hard knocks. Now, the perfunctory disclosure, my talk is not going to have any issues of conflicts of interest. I'm not going to discuss commercial products or services. I'm not going to discuss unapproved or off-label uses of any commercial product or device. Now, I have written nine learning objectives, which I hope you'll gain an understanding that relate to the cancer problem. And they're summarized in the following statements. Number one, we are currently facing an epidemic of cancer in the US. This dreaded disease has afflicted or affected nearly all of us. Two, the cancer problem we face today is largely due to the proliferation of synthetic environmental carcinogens found in cigarette smoke, processed foods, shipyards, nuclear reactors, and industries such as plastics, oil refineries, and mining. Three, cancer is a disease characterized by abnormal cells that have acquired the ability to grow faster than the remainder of our body's normal cells. And this abnormal growth of cancer is the major cause of cancer morbidity and mortality. Fourth, cancer is a disease of our DNA, in which the majority of our normal genes are affected through genetic alterations. Thus, cancer is a difficult disease to treat effectively because it is hard to neutralize all of these affected genes. Five, improve screening for cancer at its earlier stages, including the stage of precancer, has resulted in a significant decrease in cancer mortality for a large number of different cancers. Six point, between the period of President Nixon's war on cancer in 1971 and the President Obama's moonshot, over $500 billion has been spent on the cancer problem and this money has been proportionally allocated to those cancers with the greatest impact on mortality. The same federal allocation has been administered predominantly through the National Cancer Institute, which has budgeted the monies proportionately to those areas of our nation where cancer morbidity and mortality are the highest. Seven, our present era of personalized medicine in which we can successfully sequence every patient's cancer genome has resulted in precise cancer therapy, which can be used to individualize therapy for significant numbers of cancer patients. 
This approach has given birth to the clinical trial, a systematic and well-controlled method to evaluate newer therapies and compare them to old, older established therapies. Eight, the most important parameters in evaluating the success of a new cancer therapy on patients are number and type of tumor responses, partial or complete responses. And finally, cancer education and teaching at all levels are an essential part of any academic and community cancer effort, and if successfully carried out, will undoubtedly lead to both student as well as faculty satisfaction and happiness. Those are the points we're going to cover. But I need to give you a pretest. So I'd like you to take out your cell phones. And we are providing free student Roseman access to everybody. You just pick the Wi-Fi, which is named LAS student. And you don't even need a password. Now after you do that, how many people have smartphones? How many people have dumb phones? <laughs> That's just texting and a phone call. So the smartphone people, I want you to go to paulev.com slash sbarsky and select go. And for those who can't go to the web, who have dumb phones, I want you to do text messaging. I want you to type in the two line, 22333, and in the message line, S. Barsky. And if you've done that successfully, you'll get a message. You've joined Sanford H. Barsky's session. So for the smartphones, go to Paul F. Kahn. If you've done it right, you should see a screen on your phone. That I don't want you to vote yet. I just want you to get to this screen. For the text messaging people, you won't see a screen. You'll just get a message, you join Sanford Barsky session, and then you'll ultimately have to vote. And I'll tell you how to do that in a second. <coughs> Are you all logged in? test is going to consist of just one question. Looking at these nine statements, number one, we're facing an epidemic of cancer. I don't want you to vote yet. <laughs> Two, the cancer, problem, the cancer problem we face today is due to the proliferation of synthetic and environmental carcinogens. Three, cancer is a disease characterized by abnormal cells that acquire the ability to grow faster than the remainder of our body's normal cells. Four, cancer is a disease of our DNA in which a number of genetic alterations have occurred in many genes and it's hard to neutralize them. Improved screening, however, for cancer has resulted in a significant decrease in cancer mortality for a large number of cancers. Six, between President Nixon's war the Obama moonshot, we've spent $500 billion, and this money has been allocated proportionally to cancers with the greatest impact of mortality and morbidity, and the federal allocation has been administered predominantly through the NCI appropriately to areas of our country where cancer morbidity and mortality are the highest. Our era of personalized medicine, which can sequence everyone's genome, has led to individual eye therapy for cancer. And this has given birth to the clinical trial, which we're going to talk about. And then eight, the most important parameters in evaluating success is new cancer therapy is the type of tumor responses. And finally, cancer education and teaching at all levels are essential to any academic effort and if successfully carried out will undoubtedly lead to both student as well as faculty satisfaction and happiness. Now we're going to discuss every one of these and we're going to have a question and answer period after number five and then again after eight. Now this is what I want you to do. If you think every one of these statements is true, I don't want you to vote yet. We're going to count to five and I'm going to say vote. But if you think every one of these statements is true, you're going to pick A. If you think most of these statements are true, but not all, you're going to pick B. 
If you think only a minority of these statements are true, you're going to pick C. If you think all these statements are false with the exception of one, you're going to pick D. And if you think every one of these statements is a bold-faced lie, you're going to pick E. Okay, I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to say vote. Now, some people are already voted. I want to tell you, the way this works, if you voted already, you cannot vote again. You are locked in. So, are you all ready? One, two, three, four, five, vote. Sixty-one percent think all the statements are true. Sixteen percent think most are true. Twenty percent think only a minority are true, and four percent think uh, that's changed. It moves as you vote, you know. Four percent thinks one, and one person thinks not one person. Nobody thinks they're all false. We're going to keep the statements up, so you can, you know, prefer, I hope you, they're a little smaller, we'll try to get them on one screen. Okay, so, i got to tell you, we got to do some major remediation. <laughs> because every one of these statements is false. And that's why this talk <laughs> is called the Mystifying Cancer. We are currently facing an epidemic of cancer in the U.S. And this dreaded disease has afflicted or affected nearly all of us. So we have to remember <coughs> cancer isn't a single disease. Virtually any organ in the body can give rise to cancer. In 2012, the American Cancer Society, every year, uh, composes statistics in males. The most common cancer is prostate. In females, of course, breast. Uh, but not in terms of cause of death. In both sexes, cancer of the lung is the leading cause of, of death. And you can see the different cancers. They have significant incidence figures and certainly a significant uh, degree of age-adjusted mortality. But if you look carefully at the incidence figures, you see a small increase in female incidence. It seems like there's a peak in male incidence in terms of more mortality, there's a gentle decrease. It's not overwhelming. But if you look critically at individual cancers, you in fact find that cancers of the lung are on the decrease. Colorectal cancer is on the decrease. Urinary bladder in males is about the same. Melanoma slight increase. And this slide points a very interesting point, makes a very interesting point. See, prostate cancer was thought to be undergoing an increase but it's an artifactual increase. It's due to the sensitivity of the prosthetic specific antigen test. It detected more patients with prostate cancer, but the absolute incidence didn't really change. They were always there, except it was never, ever detected. So if you, if you account for the increase in prostate cancer, this peak in now incidence is really artifactually elevated. Slight increase in breast cancer <coughs> due to, again, mammogram picking up more cases, but not an absolute increase. So the moral of this story is there is no cancer epidemic. Epidemics are diseases like AIDS or swine flu, which show an exponential progression. And as you can see from these curves, most cancers have actually decreased in incidence. It's the opposite of an epidemic. If we look at age-adjusted mortality way back to 1930, we see that most cancers, this curve is basically a flat line. Some cancers have decre decreased, like gastric cancer, some have increased. Most have stayed relatively constant. And this is in females, same story. Most relatively constant. Some increase, some decrease, but overall, certainly no cancer epidemic. So we are currently facing an epidemic of cancer False. The incidence really hasn't changed in the last century if we adjust for age. And although it's affected all of us, it's not because it's an epidemic, it's because the disease has catastrophic effects on people. 
Second statement, the cancer problem we face today is largely due to the proliferation of synthetic environmental carcinogens found in smoke, foods, shipyards, etc. Now, there's no question there are carcinogens in meat and in processed foods. There's, there's been an exposure to over 100,000 industrial toxins never before seen in the history of mankind that's been released into the environment. There's mass use of known carcinogens such as chlorine and fluoride in our public water supply. And we all know about the explosion of cigarette uh, smoking in our society after World War II. But you see there is as many carcinogens in nature as there are synthetic carcinogens. There are many carcinogens in plant food. In tannins, for example, occur in plant food. And we ingest them daily in tea, coffee, and cocoa. Tannic acid is carcinogenic. In cycad plants, which are important food sources in tropical regions, they contain cytosin and azoxyglycosides, which cause liver and kidney tumors. We know about the areca and beetle nut story, which causes oral cancer throughout the world. Saffron is a natural carcinogen. Black pepper contains pyrimidine and alpha-methylpyrrolene. And we all know about aflatoxins, probably the <coughs> leading cause of hepatocellular cancer in the Far East. So there as many natural carcinogens as there are synthetic ones. And remember, a carcinogen is simply a chemical that can bind to DNA. It's electrophilic. It seeks electrons. And when it does, it can cause mutations. Now, it's also important to use the lessons of history. In ancient times, we know that cancers occurred. And there was no synthetic carcinogens in ancient times. Our evidence is from Egyptian hieroglyphics, Mayan statues, cave paintings, historical sculptures, fossil and paleopathological evidence. For example, in this fossil from the pre-Columbian era, about 5,000 years BC, paleopathologists think that these little black lesions in the skull represent multiple myeloma. There are examples of lytic lesions thought to be metastatic <coughs> breast cancer in the scapula. There was a recent case a few thousands of years ago in the tibia of osteogenic sarcoma. And this famous sculpture of Michelangelo's called Night. Experts think if you look at the left breast, the breast nipple is inverted and there's adenopathy in the axilla and supraclavicular area, and this is stage three breast cancer. Now, what's important to recognize is that in ancient times, cancer was probably rare. But people lived rarely to be much older than age 30. If we look at cancer in our modern society, it also would be rare before the age of 30. You see, the lesson here is that cancer is a disease of aging. And the greatest risk factor for cancer is not cigarette smoke or aflatoxin. It's mere aging. Cancer goes up exponentially as a function of age. And as we age, it turns out that most cancers occur spontaneously and sporadically. People seem to be obsessed with finding risk factors or family history or a germline mutation. And that gives us a false sense of security, because if people don't have a family history, and people don't have a BRCA1 or 2 history, they have this false sense of security. I don't need to go for my colonoscopy, because I don't eat meat, and I exercise regularly. False. Most cancers occur without a family history, without a germline mutation. Most cancers occur spontaneously and sporadically. Now, the Greeks called, the ancient Greeks called this disease cancer. Because with a little imagination, I think you could make out the sign of the zodiac of cancer of the crab. And this really reflects one of the key features of cancer, that it can invade adjacent host tissues. And the cancer derived from the Greek word karpinos means crab, or a mass that extends. Now, if you look at the history of cancer research, you could probably pick a few important observations that summarize the essence of this disease. But you could say Rudolf Urkow, who was a pathologist, who saw under the microscope that cancers began as cells, that cancer was a disease of our own cells. That would be an important observation. Or 
if you found evidence, well, if you cited the discovery of DNA, the structure of DNA in 1953 by Watson and Crick, since cancer, as we'll see, is a disease of our DNA, you could say that was the, the most important observation. Or you could say the discovery of the first gene that could set in motion cancer, called the oncogene, by uh, Varmus and Bishop, which was in uh, uh, 1976, the cellular origin of retroviral oncogenes. You could pick the, them. But for me, the one individual who best summarizes the cancer problem and why cancers are so difficult to treat are not any of these. It would be Charles Darwin. You all know that Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, where he advanced the theory of evolution. He basically said, as we evolve as a species, as the animal and plant kingdom evolve, we have a series of mutations which happen by random. But nature selects for the survival of the fittest. And if you have a mutation that gives you an advantage, you, you continue. If you, have, if you don't have a mutation, like the dinosaurs, they found themselves in an environment where they couldn't survive, they perished. Now, here's the rub. Cancers largely occur after the age of procreation, the age we have had our children. And therefore, our creator, or if you believe in nature, you can actually believe in both if you believe the creator set in motion the natural laws of the universe. Evolution, or our creator, has not provided our bodies with the natural defense against this dreaded disease. Because if we got cancer before we had our children, we'd either mutate and be able to defeat this disease, or we would not exist, we wouldn't be here today, because there would be no homo sapiens species. But we had get cancer after we've procreated. So you see, we don't have a natural ability to fight this disease, and that's why, in the final analysis, cancer has proven so difficult to treat, or prevent, or detect in its early stages. You can all blame Charles Darwin. So, the cancer problem we face today is largely due to the proliferous synthetic environmental carcinogens. That statement is false. There's many natural carcinogens, and it's mainly due to aging. Next, cancer is a disease <coughs> characterized by abnormal cells that have acquired the ability to grow faster than the remainder of our body's normal cells. And this abnormal growth is the major cause of cancer morbidity and mortality. Well, we know that human cancer is derived usually from a single ancestral cell. And this is why cancers are called monoclonal or clonal in origin. But as cancers grow, this is actually a, a type of cancer of the testes called seminoma, and it consists of a monotonous sheet of cells derived from a single ancestral cell. And certainly one of the key properties of cancer is uncontrolled growth. And actually under the microscope we see evidence of that. We can find abnormal mitoses, and we can find evidence of, uh, of growth in a, in a tissue section. But the problem is not every cell in a given cancer is actively growing. Some cells can be in resting phase. But not only that, as a cancer grows, its cells, even though derived from a common ancestral cell, don't resemble one another. That's called tumor cell heterogeneity. They change in their features. And every cell can differ from their neighbor. Now, human cancers have a relatively fast doubling time. It, they thought to range in, in early uh, disease between 5 and 100 days, between 10 and 500 days. And the cell cycle, and especially molecules called cyclin-dependent kinases, have been exploited therapeutically in terms of our chemotherapy. But the problem is, is that many of the body's normal cells divide more rapidly than cancer. The bone marrow uh, divides more rapidly. Hair follicles uh, divide more rapidly. Cells that line our mouth and GI tract. And of course, the developing fetus, which goes from one cell to, in 40 weeks, to a, you know, a ma uh, uh, an organism that weighs a number of kilograms, grows much, much faster than even the fastest. 
So therefore, you see, when we, tra we try to treat cancer, we have what's called dose-limiting toxicity. And our clinical colleagues in the community, our clinical oncology colleagues will tell you that they wish they could treat every cancer effectively, but there's what's called dose-limiting toxicity. Well, white cows, balding or alopecia, ulcers along the GI tract and mouth, and of course, <clears throat> chemotherapy would cause abortion and fetal malformations in the developing fetus. Now, one of the problems of cancer, in addition to proliferation, is that it doesn't stay put. It, it invades adjacent tissue, and it gets into lymphatics and blood vessels, and it gets into the circulation, and it forms metastasis. Now, one of the things we do when we work up a patient with cancer, we ask the question, is the biopsy cancer or not? Virtually everybody with cancer has to have a tissue biopsy. They say the tissue is the issue. And since I'm a pathologist, I'm not going to argue with them. <laughs> is the biopsy cancer? Then we, we engage ourselves in what's called grading. What is the degree of differentiation? And then finally, staging. How advanced is the cancer? And this shows a breast cancer that is breaking through the basement membrane and it's producing what's called a focus of microinvasion. And then eventually it can get into lymphatics and it can move to the regional lymph node, like in the axilla. I like to call this slide a metastasis caught in the act. And then unfortunately it can, it can go to internal viscera and form uh, stage four metastatic disease. It's interesting, not only did the Greeks call the disease carcinos, but they coined other words that are relevant today. They recognize that cancers grow into masses, and the term onkos, that's the prefix for oncology. They also recognize that cancers metastasize, and they, the word there is meta for displacement. Now, it's interestingly that the sequence of these observations inversely correlated with therapeutic outcomes. And from that came the TNN system of staging. T stands for tumor, N stands for node, and M stands for metastases. As it turns out, if most cancers only have a T, and the N is zero and the M is zero, they're usually treatable by surgical extirp extirpation. If they also involve regional lymph nodes, they still can do well with either adjuvant chemo or radiotherapy. But when they form distant, overt metastases, they become extremely difficult to treat. Now, I'm going to be showing in this talk a number of curves called Kaplan-Meier curves. These are curves that you need to be familiar with. They show survival over a number of years from diagnosis in terms of percentage. So for example, and this is just a typical cancer of stage one, you can see that most people survive. For a stage two, there's a little bit of a dropout stage three more, but in stage four, you see a dramatic decrease. Now, there's one other point of these, of these curves. You see, when the curve levels off, there are no more additional deaths. And so we speak, for example, of cancer as having five-year survival, 10-year survival. You've all heard those terms. Why do we speak that way? Because according to the Kaplan-Meier curve, when the curve levels off, one could consider essentially that the patient has survived, although there are examples of late recurrences. Now it turns out, as I showed you here, for stage four disease, the outcome is not good. Now this doesn't mean that adjuvant chemotherapy doesn't work <coughs> because adjuvant chemo is applied before there's overt uh, metastasis. But Conventional cytotoxic chemo has proved unable to cure most cancers after they have manifested overt metastases or stage four disease. So metastasis with growth are the issues. And therefore, cancer and disease characterized by abnormal cells and acquire the ability to go faster than the remainder of our body's normal cells. And growth alone is the cause of morbidity. That statement is false. Four. Cancer is a disease of our DNA in which the majority of our normal genes are affected through genetic alterations. Thus, cancer is a difficult disease to treat effectively because it is hard to neutralize all of these affected genes. There's no question that cancer is primarily a disease of DNA. 
The bases of our DNA are mutated or rearranged or lost or amplified, and that's the primary lesion. But remember that mutations are occurring in our DNA all the time. Our DNA repair mechanisms, our immune surveillance mechanisms, and our programmed cell death mechanisms are all at work monitoring these mutations. But as we age, these mechanisms become less efficient, and mutations may occur undetected and uncorrected. Now, the classes of genes that have been implicated in cancer, there are several other classes, but the main classes are what are called oncogenes and what are called tumor suppressor genes. We know that cancer goes through a series of steps uh, that involve changes of normal cells to cells that show hyperplasia, and then atypia, and then what we call carcinoma in situ, and then finally invasive cancer. We know experimentally cancers go through a series of steps where normal cells lose contact inhibition and grow in plaques, and they, they also form tumors in mice. But if we look at the outcome, different types of breast cancer. Here's a different types. This is called luminal A, luminal B. And one of the types is HER2 nu. This has a worse prognosis. Uh, it certainly did before there was a therapy uh, based uh, against this. But see, this shows that one gene and targeting just one gene can alter the course of cancer. And as it turns out, there aren't that many genes that are altered. There's only a handful. There's, in, in, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, there's only one gene. The BCL able oncogene is rearranged. One gene causes the disease. In a solid cancer, uh, the P53 suppressor gene can be mutated. One of the oncogenes can be altered through mutation. But not that many genes are structurally altered. Now, this alteration can set in motion altered expression of a number of cellular genes. But there are therefore only a handful of genes that are altered in any, are structurally altered in, in any given cancers. The vast majority of cancer genes are not structurally different from the genes in normal cells. And that makes this point. Not only is cancer a disease of our own cells, but cancers deviate only minimally from our normal cells. This only minimal deviation is very hard to exploit therapeutically. So the statement that cancer is a disease of our DNA, in which the majority of our normal genes are affected through genetic alterations, is false. And we can, we, it's very difficult to neutralize genes. We try to neutralize one or two, like HER2 new, but this statement, therefore, is false. Next statement. Improved screening for cancer at its earlier stages, including the stage of pre-cancer, has resulted in a significant decrease in cancer mortality for a large number of different cancers. But remember this, the purpose of screening is not to detect more cancer, PSA did that, but to detect early cancer and pre-cancer when intervention would make a difference. <coughs> remember also that this step of metastasis, which I showed you, is an early event in cancer progression. In fact, the majority of patients who present in the clinic with a breast lump or with a cancer detected on colonoscopy, the majority of those patients already have developed micrometastasis because cancer spread and they spread early. Now, let's look at these age-adjusted mortality curves again. You see, most of the curves are a flat line. When a curve is a flat line, you can conclude a number of things. The therapy of metastatic disease is no good. Chemo prevention doesn't work. And screening is not effective because any of these things would reduce the age-adjusted mortality. Now, the cancer that stands out is colorectal cancer. See, there's a decrease. If we go from 2005 to the present day, this curve has continued to decrease. And in females, the curve that's, that really stands out is uterine, or actually this means cervical cancer, and that's due to the effectiveness of the pap smear. So when the American Cancer Society puts out these kind of statistics of how many deaths are averted, 
they're a little misrepresentative because they're reflecting the cessation of smoking. If you stop smoking, lung cancer incident goes down and lung cancer mortality goes down. If you effectively screen for cervical cancer, this death will go down, and <coughs> colon cancer, this will go down. But it doesn't mean the majority of metastatic cancers we, we've really done anything with. So, the pap smear is known to everybody. It's, it's exfoliating cells from the cervix, and pathologists look at these uh, cells under the microscope. This is the science of cytology. But I have to tell you, with the HPV vaccine that's now being introduced in this country, which will e eliminate cervical dysplasia from HPV and cervical cancer from HPV, which is the cause of 99% of cervical cancer, it is my feeling that the pap smear will no longer represent the most effective screen, and it will be replaced by colonoscopy and fecal immunoglobulin tests for blood in the stool. Colonoscopy is designed to detect pre-neoplastic, uh, pre-cancerous neoplastic polyps, which if extirpated, remove the chance that you will develop colon cancer. And of course, detecting hemoglobin in the blood is designed to not detect polyps, but early cancer, where intervention can be important. So these two tests represent effective screening. So the bottom line is, Screening presently only works significantly in two cancers. In, in cervical cancer, which is the age, which is the PEP test, the colon cancer, which is the immuno uh, hemoglobin test, and colonoscopy. It does not work for the, effectively for the majority of other cancers. So this statement is also false. Now it's all about choice, right? You can choose to have your colonoscopy or not. All you people chose to come here and hear me speak. You could have been somewhere else. Roseman has chosen to form a college of medicine. It's all about choice. So I want to tell you a story about choice. As it turns out, there was a Jewish boy and a, his Catholic friend. And they were very religious. They went to synagogue and church every week. They went to all the holidays. But they, but they were also devout football fans. And they were from Ohio. And they were ardent fans of the Ohio State Buckeyes. And the schedule came out. And they noticed that the, the season opened against uh, Wisconsin. And when, the opening was on Yom Kippur Eve, the most sacred night of the Jewish year. And then later in the schedule, they noticed the game against their arch nemesis, the University of Michigan, was on Christmas Eve. And they looked at each other and they said, what are we going to do? We're devout football fans, but we're devout believers in Judaism and Catholicism. So one of them says, let's go see our priest and our rabbi. We happen to be in town at a conference. And so they went to these people and said, we got a problem. We're devout football fans, but we're also religious. What are we going to do? So the priest and the rabbi looked at each other, and they looked up in the heavens, and they said, my sons, don't worry. God answers every, every uh, need. The solution is obvious. Have you never heard of a DVD player or a Blu-ray player? They looked at each other, they looked at the priests and the rabbi, and they said, oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi. We're so, so grateful, so grateful. Of course we know what a DVD player is, and we, we know what a Blu-ray is, we own it. But we're so grateful, so grateful. Because we didn't realize until now that you would allow the video recording of your sermons. <laughs> about choice. <laughs> so, we're going to have our first question and answer period of any of the five points. You can ask me a question about this joke, too, if you want. <laughs> any questions? Yes? So, th this is not specifically about the, the falsehoods on the, on the slide, but with fecal blood testing in the clinic and there's the 
car to the developer. And now the thing is to, to send them for a fit test, which is, um, you know, I, I was, as a, as a clinician, I was told, oh, this is for quality control. But there's a little cynical part of me that says, or it's because the, the lab can build for that. Can you speak to the additional value of sending it somewhere as opposed to my um, either giving those parts to my patient and having them just drop them off in clinic where I simply document the result or do a rectal exam, which everybody like comes in and clamors for? Um, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, a rectal exam is no good because when you traumatize the rectum, you can cause some bleeding from hemorrhoids and give you a false positive. The immuno, this is an immunohistochemical test. It has to be done by a lab that knows how to do it. By the way, this is one of the tests we want to develop at Roseman so we prevent this out-of-state migration of pathology. It's a very good test because, number one, it does not detect upper <coughs> GI bleeding like the GUI tests would do, right? The cult blood test. It detects only lower GI blood because when the blood gets too denatured, the antibody won't recognize. It also won't be positive with uh, you know, eating meat or, or other sources of hemoglobin. So it's a pretty good test, and there have been a number of randomized trials in Europe comparing its efficacy to colonoscopy. Now remember, more people are compliant with the, with the blood tests on their stool than they are getting colonoscopy. So you have to factor that in. Colonoscopy theoretically is much better because it detects precancerous polyps, where the blood test detects cancers that are bleeding, and, and hopefully in early stage. But when you weigh both of them, the compliance issue against the sensitivity, most studies in Europe have shown they're equivalent. Now, they're not long-term studies. Like you, the real question is, does this, how does this impact age-adjusted mortality of colon cancer, right? And we need 10 years of studies to answer that question. But I would say that's a great test, and it should be done. And later in the talk, I'm going to talk about how it's not done in Nevada, especially southern Nevada. Thank you. There were a few other questions. Yes, sir. I, I'm kind of thinking about something that's within that topic. So OK. About. Uh, cancer cells, I understand, um, have the ability to you know, they, they can grow, they grow in aerobic without oxygen. Because the, because the oxygen is there, they use it up. Now they go in and over that pathway. So, but if they were presented with oxygen, somehow and sprayed it in there, could they switch what they can do if they grow aerobically and use the oxygen? Do they have that capability or we don't know that? Oh, we do know that. The cancer cells are very versatile. And the majority of cells are well oxygenated. There's what's called tumor angiogenesis. They create their own blood supply. There's only a fraction of cells in a given tumor, usually those in the middle, that are relatively aerobic and they have anaerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect, which uh, was advanced many, many years ago. And when that happens, they turn on a number of genes and they can become even more aggressive. But it's wrong to think that the cancers simply have anaerobic metabolism. They do not. The majority have a regular metabolism. Any other questions? Come on, don't be intimidated. <laughs> OK. We're half done, let's move on. And by the way, I wanted to tell you all that if any of you have any questions or like a copy of my talk, which we're not going to provide here, just email me at sbarsky at roseman.edu. So, number six. Between the period of President Nixon's war on cancer and the President Obama moonshot, you all heard about the moonshot, right? Over $500 billion have been spent on the cancer problem. And this money has been proportionally allocated to those cancers with the greatest impact on mortality. And the same federal allocation has been administered predominantly <coughs> through the National Cancer Institute, which has budgeted the monies proportionally to those areas of our nation where cancer morbidity and mortality are caused. Now it's interesting because cancer dollars are not proportionally allocated. For example, if you look at deaths of cancer per year, this was in 2011, but the deaths are re recently constant for the last several years. If you compare deaths of lung cancer with breast cancer, and then you look at the amount of funding per death, there's about 20-fold dollars being spent on breast cancer research than there is on lung cancer research. 20-fold. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a breast cancer researcher, so I don't mind this ratio. <laughs> but from some perspective, it's really not fair. And the question is, why? Why? How did this happen? And it teaches us a very important lesson. You see, in 1993, a number of women organizations decided they're just sick and tired of underfunding breast cancer. So they got together, they formed the Breast Cancer Coalition, and they marched on Washington, and they demanded attention and recognition. And what Congress did, they created a special fund that they, they threw it to the Department of Defense, the DOD, Breast Cancer Program. Now, since then, there have been another, a uh, few other initiatives, but they pale in comparison to breast cancer research. So what this tells me is it's all about advocacy. And we're going to learn why that's an important lesson. So federal dollars are not correlated to the diseases that kill. I feel bad for the lung cancer patients. They don't survive very long. I think the mean survival of lung cancer is two years. And therefore, and they're not around to be advocates. The other thing is their families, there's a stigma with lung cancer because it's linked to smoking and people don't want to admit they brought the disease on themselves. And it doesn't have the same impact that breast cancer does. And so there's no advocacy. And that's why they have 20-fold 20, 20 less in funding, even though it's the major killer of men and women. Now let's look at the map of the U.S. and look at the National Cancer Institute. So it turns out they have created about 44 NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers. You know where they all mostly are? They're on the west coast. There's eight in California alone, and they're on the eastern seaboard and up through the middle. There are a few you know, in the middle of the country. They're not in, not in Nevada. But let's look at where the mortality and morbidity of cancer as a disease is the highest. Not in the west coast or the northeast, it's in the southeast where poor people live and they get advanced stage cancer. It's also in their mountain west and it's in Nevada. So you see, the federal dollars didn't, weren't directed to where cancer is the most prevalent in terms of morbidity and mortality. So you could ask, what's wrong with this picture? Now, there have been a number of studies that have shown that patients who are treated in these highfalutin um, comprehensive cancer centers do better. This one study showed they had a 10% lower chance of dying in the first year than those treated in community hospitals. The problem with this is the majority of patients who are treated for cancer don't go to the NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers. They go to the community. In Las Vegas, they go to community oncologists. And let me tell you something else. Most patients, even with Obamacare, do not have adequate health insurance <coughs> that gains them admission to NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers. These patients go to their local community doctor and oncologist. And that's why the community involvement is so, so important. Now let's look at Nevada. Now I was privileged to attend a colorectal screening seminar and I asked the ACS for permission to use some of their slides because it illustrates, I think, an important point. We have three million people in our state. It's doubled in population in the last 20 years. By the way, we do have the highest proportion of undocumented in this state. It's 8% of our population. And a diverse mix of people. There's long-term residents, recent arrivals, race, ethnicity, etc. Now, I've been in Nevada for seven years now. People tell me I can't claim to be a Nevada yet. <laughs> but I can tell you I learned to say Nevada and not Nevada. <laughs> Screening is important. I told you it's the best test we have for cancer, colon, colonoscopy, and fetal, uh, fecal hemoglobin, for hemoglobin. Screening of, uh, lowers the incidence of risk. It increases overall survival and lowers mortality. But let's look at high screening states like <laughs> Connecticut and Utah versus Nevada. The, the, the screening rate is lower. And as you can predict, there's a stage migration. See, in Nevada, only 
compared to 26%, only 21% per example in stage one disease, and 31 have stage three. And the result is the mortality rate is 16.9 compared to 11.8 and 11.0. In our state, we rank fairly low in incidence. I don't know why that is, because no one knows the cause of colon cancer. It's not due to synthetic carcinogens of meat, because people have studied meat eaters and vegetarians, and they have similar rates of cancer of the colon. But we're number 10 for mortality. And in females, we're number 40 for incidence, but we're number eight from the top for mortality. And if we look at the survival by stage, we see that Nevada ranks lower for all stages, except stage one, in both males and females compared to the US. And if we look, if we divide Nevada into north and south, we see something that's even more disturbing. See, Washoe County in the north that survives much better, 65 and 69 percent, <coughs> than Clark County in the south. So, Nevada statistics are bad, but the southern Nevada statistics are even worse. So, incidence in Nevada, the risk of the disease is average, but the mortality in Nevada is high. There's an unfavorable stage distribution, lower rates of screening, lower survival by stage, especially in Clark County, which drive the state's numbers down. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other dismal statistics. Nevada ranked near last among states for the number of active patient care physicians, per 100,000, and also near last in the number of active primary care physicians. Near last, 49th, 48th, 50th, take your pick, in the number of residents in GME programs. It's estimated we would need at least 2,000 additional physicians just to sort of get to the median. Nevada, as I'm going to show you, has no appreciable cancer research funding. And whereas 5 to 10 percent of patients treated at NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers are entered into clinical trials, Less than one-tenth of one percent of community-treated patients here are enrolled in clinical trials. Let's look at extra rural support. I was really stunned. I did a little <coughs> checking. The Department of Defense, remember they administer the breast cancer program? The number of ranks, the number of grants in the state is zero. The whole state. The number of Coleman grants is zero. There are zero ACS grants. The good news is there's two National Cancer Institute grants, but we rank 50th. Now let's compare these numbers to our neighbor to the west, California. California ranks number one in grants. There are currently 985 National Cancer Institute grants in California. 985, think about that, and two in Nevada. <coughs> Everybody knows about Susan Coleman's race for the cure. They just held it up uh, at the uh, Red Rock Hotel and Casino several months ago. The Red, the Red Rock Hotel, which is a great hotel and casino, they're going to be uh, they're going to be holding an American Cancer Society fundraiser in the near in the next few months. And I think that's really great. And actually, at the race for the cure, I drove by because I kind of wanted to go in the sports book, and I got turned away because all these women were running in the race. Thousands of Nevadans participate in the race. But Nevada scientists and physicians and patients aren't sampling the cure. Las Vegas is the 28th largest city in the U.S. It's as large as it's ever been. It is growing quickly, faster than 87% of similarly sized cities since 2000. But reputation wise, it's an international city. It's considered the gaming and entertainment capital of the world, maybe the, in the US, maybe the world. But recently, there's a city called Macau in China that some lists has overtaken. Las Vegas is the number one gaming and gambling place in the world. There are a lot of casinos in Macau that are, have been formed by casino owners from Las Vegas. 
but I was shocked to learn that there's an Institute of Chinese Medical Science in Macau. It's one of the leading medical schools and research universities in all of China. So that means you could be the gaming capital of the world and still support a medical school. <laughs> the strip is a tremendous resource of philanthropy, but its recipients historically have not been predominantly Nevada academic institutions or Nevada scientists. And we all live in this zip code, right? Most of us, 89135. I just got a magazine. It's called 89135. And I leaped through it on the first page is an advertisement for diamonds, big diamonds. On the next page is an advertisement for cruises to the Caribbean. The next, there's an advertisement for plastic surgery. And as I went through this book, I saw one Jewish American princess ad after another. So the point is, 89135 are composed of the haves have mores. And there's no reason really that philanthropy can't be used to benefit the Vatican institutions. Let me tell you, UCLA, where I was privileged to work for 20 years, has an annual research budget of one billion dollars. One billion dollars. Do you think they need a million dollars or 10 million from Nevada? Do you think that would make any difference with a budget of one billion? I can tell you it will not. But it would make all the difference to the Vatican institutions. <clears throat> so let's look at the reasons for the north-south gap. You know there's lower screening in the gap. Maybe that's the reason mortality for colon cancer is worse. Maybe, just maybe, it's related to the lower number of general and family practice physicians here. Or the lower, lower number of medical doctors. And the lower number of physical physician specialists. Maybe, just maybe, it's related to the fact that there's no allopathic college of medicine in Southern Nevada. And there may be, just maybe, it's related to the fact that a medical school which promotes research and promotes training of physicians and promotes clinical trials doesn't happen. Maybe the mortality of the Vatans, you see, aren't affected by the gifts to California or the Coleman raising all this money. It doesn't help the people of the state. And the truth is, we all bear responsibility for this. Commiserating or talking about it isn't going to help. Wishful thinking isn't going to help. I remember clearly the lesson about, uh, from those breast cancer advocates who marched on Washington. They made a difference because they believed in advocacy. So what will help? Advocacy for a college of medicine. Advocacy <coughs> for cancer research funding. Advocacy for clinical trials and advocacy for Nevada philanthropy to stay here in Nevada. The other thing that will help is clearly working together. Because let me tell you, if we don't work together, there's no way we'll tackle the emperor of all maladies. So, between the period of President Nixon's war on cancer and the Obama moonshot, it's true that $500 billion have been spent but the money has not been allocated to those cancers with the greatest impact on mortality. And the National Cancer Institute certainly has not budgeted the monies proportionately to those areas of our nation where cancer morbidity and mortality are the highest. They've done the opposite. <coughs> but that's been paralleled by these private foundations, and it's been paralleled by Nevada's own philanthropy. So this statement is false. Next. A present era of personalized medicine in which we can successfully sequence every patient's cancer genome has resulted in precise cancer therapy which can be used to individualize therapy for significant numbers. This approach has given birth to the clinical trial, a systematic and well-controlled method to evaluate newer therapies. Well, first of all, it's not given birth to the clinical trial. 
clinical trials existed a long time ago, before there was personalized or precision or genomic medicine. Clinical trials existed before we even knew that cancer was a disease of, of DNA, before the molecular. <coughs> In fact, there's an early example of a clinical trial. James Lynn, who was a physician in the British Navy, gave sailors who were suffering from scurvy lemons and limes to eat. And the story goes, they were, they were effectively treated. That was in 1747. And a lot of lectures I've attended have given this as the first clinical trial. But I have problems with this trial. First of all, I don't know what the control group was. I don't know if it was randomized. We don't have the original data. And I don't believe the work was ever published. <laughs> so I found evidence of another clinical trial, an earlier one, in the book of Daniel. See, Daniel was led into exile with the Jewish people. And he appeared at the court of Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. And it says in chapter 1, verse 8 to 16, Daniel prepares in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Then Daniel said to his steward, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our countenance be looked upon thee and the countenance of the youths that eat of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. And at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer, and they were fatter in the flesh than all the youths which did eat of the king's meat. It seems to be randomized. It's prospective. We have the original data. <laughs> And the work was published <laughs> in a very high impact journal. <laughs> the question can be asked, do clinical trials provide the best care for cancer patients? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Clinical trials provide more options. Clinical trials provide access to the newest therapeutic concepts. Protocol therapy is standardized. And remember that nearly every, sta every standard treatment today began as a clinical trial. Now, the statistics are good. Only about 3% of patients nationwide are enrolled in clinical trials in cancer. That means 97% of patients are not. That means 97% of patients with cancer do not advance our knowledge of this disease. You know, clinical trials are like education, and they're like research. Their design is to improve things for the future. There are about 100,000 cancer patients enrolled in clinical trials in about 1,000 phase one studies. But as I said in Nevada, these numbers are extremely low. Now, the FDA regulates this process. There first has to be preclinical laboratory testing of things, and that's what we would like to think we do at Roseman in our laboratories for those that are doing cancer research. Only about one of every 500 candidate molecules identified in preclinical labs can enter phase one. This process is strictly regulated by the FDA, and the phase one can be on morbid cancer patients or it can be on healthy volunteers, and it's the first testing of any drug or therapy in humans with the design of only determined toxicity profile or dose. And it's usually limited to 10 to 100 patients. In the phase two, and you have to pass through phase one to get to phase two, phase two simply measures the ability of a drug to shrink a tumor. And usually 100 to several hundred patients are involved. And then phase three, which is the most stringent, it compares new therapy with standard therapy. It requires randomization in large numbers, several thousand at least. And its endpoints are not shrinking of tumor, but it's disease-free survival and overall survival. Now, if one looks at the probability of going from phase one to two, et cetera, about 60, remember, only one of 500 molecules in the lab makes it to a phase one. And those that, that enter phase one, about 63% of those can make it to phase two. And about 30% of those make it to phase three. And most in phase three eventually get a new drug uh, application in to the FDA, about 85%. But overall, from phase one to final approval, it's only about 9.6%. The 
The drug development trends through these trials. We have standard chemotherapy. We now have monoclonal antibodies that end in MAB. We have small molecules which end in the suffix IB. And most of these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We have smart bombs, which are a combination of chemotherapy and monoclonal antibodies. We have biologicals. This is a hot area now. The immunomodulators, which are mainly targeting the PDL1, PD1 interaction between tumor cells and T cells. Combinations of immunomodulators are small molecules. But having said all this, only about 10 to 20 new cancer drugs get approved by the FDA per year. The FDA does have a policy of fast tracking. They can approve a drug in phase two and approve it for use, but that drug eventually has to go and pass phase three. And then in oncology, there's more and more of this practice of off-label use of an FDA approved drug for an unapproved purpose. Now, there's danger in some of these trends. Fast tracking often gets the FDA in trouble. There was a drug called Avastin, which was used in breast cancer that passed phase two. Everyone was all excited. It was approved. It was fast tracked. But when it entered phase three, it didn't show any effect. They had to recall the drug. Drug development is very, very expensive. The average new drug costs a patient or their insurance about $100,000 per year. And the advantages, as we'll see in some Kaplan-Meier curves, are only incremental. There's an increase in survival of several months. And remember that every drug has side effects, and side effects are additive. The off-label use of a drug is very risky. And that brings us to the subject of personalized medicine. You've all heard this term. The feds have revised it, and now they call it precision medicine, which is probably more accurate. Personalized medicine is built on the premise that lab tests can accurately predict the response of an individual to a particular treatment. Most drugs are prescribed on the basis of one size fits all. It aims to eliminate the trial and error practice of matching the right drug to the right patient. It's driven by scientific innovation and better understanding of disease heterogeneity. Patients, doctors, payers, regulators all expect it to happen, and it's considered the future of medicine. When we look critically at the different diseases that are currently being treated, we see that medicine remains largely empiric. It's not personalized. <coughs> About 20% of patients with cancer are treated, and they don't respond. They respond to their drug, but 80% don't, and so they're treated with a second-line drug. The same is true for plebeian diseases, such as osteoporosis and rheumatoid arthritis, and asthma, and schizophrenia, and depression the opposite of precision or personalized medicine. So the question can be asked, these are nice words, but is personalized medicine or precision medicine, is it really possible? And if the answer is it is possible. If we have markers of disease, specifically surrogate endpoint markers and predictive markers that will guide our therapy, we all know the example with breast cancer and the HER2 new oncogene, which is amplified and can be detected pathologically with an immunocytochemical test. If we compare the, in the Kaplan-Meier curve, the overall survival of metastatic breast cancer in patients who are treated with trichuzumib or Herceptin, they do better than patients who are not. But again, the survival difference is not tremendous, it's significant, but it's not a, really a home run. The point is this, if breast cancer wasn't stratified according to her to new amplification, and if everybody with breast cancer metastatic was treated with Herceptin, these two curves would converge and the drug would show no effect. So here you see the biomarker, the prognostic marker, is as important as the drug. Now, it turns out that with precision, with the molecular error, you might think that there is a plethora of molecular targets, and there is. But paradoxically, because the cost of drug development last year, or in 2004, it was $390 billion. That's what big pharma spends. The number of new drug applications is actually paradoxically decreasing because these trials are extremely expensive. And if we had a surrogate endpoint marker, 
that can be used in lieu of age-adjusted survival or disease-free survival, it would save drug companies tons of money. It would get drugs through the process, uh, through the FDA process, much more quicker. This was an example of Tarceva, which was a drug designed to detect a activating tyrosine kinase mutation in small cell cancer of the lung. And again, if you treated everybody with non-small cell cancer, these two curves would converge, and the drug would never have been approved. So the secret of personalized medicine and precision medicine is to find more and more biomarkers that can stratify patients. It's true in cancer, one drug, one glove doesn't fit all. Probably five gloves fit all. That's not personalized medicine, because it would mean every person would have tailored therapy. And it, we're starting to get a little degree of precision. But the statement in which, because we can sequence every patient's cancer genome, which we can, has resulted in precise cancer therapy, which can be used to individualize therapy, is false. And as I showed you, it's not giving birth to the clinical trial, which was here a long, long, time ago. So this statement is also false. Eight, the most important parameter in evaluating the impact of the new cancer therapy on patients are number and type of tumor responses, partial versus complete. Now as it turns out, many cancers respond to a drug because the proliferating population of a cancer is susceptible. But it's known that cancer, cancers have reserve populations, which are called stem cells. And these stem cells can be resistant to conventional chemotherapeutic drugs, and they can then repopulate the tumor. The, the, the tumor cells can circulate in terms of circulating tumor cells. They sometimes can produce circulating DNA, circulating exosomes, and they can reflect driver and passenger mutations. But the point is, the things that are detected in phase two, which is just shrinking of the tumor, may not impact age-adjusted sur uh, survival or disease-free survival if the stem cell repopulates the tumor in a timely manner. Here, in a, a metastasis that has no stem cells, there may be no metastasis. In those that have some stem cells, they can get metastases in, in a, month, a few months to a few years, or with a partial malignant potential, they can get a period of dormancy followed by metastasis after many years. These Kaplan-Meier curves also illustrate an important point. This is age, this is disease-free survival time to metastasis. This is overall survival, which reflects not only recurrence of the cancer, but any uh, treatment-induced uh, mortality. What's important to realize is that these curves apply to groups and not individuals. And I've seen doctors and patients confused about this. You see, here, this curve is luminal A. Let's look here. Luminal A breast cancer, that's the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, a really good prognosis. Look, 90% survived 96 months. And the triple negative, which is down here, less than 20% survived. <coughs> So a doctor, in seeing a patient with luminal A, will say, good news, you have a 90% chance of surviving. Or somebody will see a patient with triple negative and they'll say, not so good news, you have a 20% chance of surviving. That's false. These numbers apply to the group of patients the patient belongs to. So 10% of patients with luminal A won't survive, and 20% of triple negative will survive. Nobody can ever predict what an individual patient will do when it comes to cancer. And I see this assumption made all the time in patients and in my clinical colleagues. <coughs> and that brings us to another parameter, which is called quality of life. Now, you might be thinking, what does a pathologist have to say about quality of life? I have to tell you, not only am I a pathologist but a cancer scientist, but unfortunately, I've also been a cancer patient. So I think I can talk about quality of life. There is a big difference between doctors and patients and how they view things. 
let me tell you, if you're both a cancer doctor and a cancer patient, it's much better to be the cancer doctor. <laughs> See, pathologists think any cancer is interesting. Under the microscope, it looks great, right? And my clinical colleagues, you know, they view patients somewhat differently. They've had successes and they've had failures and they, they like to pat themselves on the back when they have a success. But a patient views things a lot differently. A patient compares things differently. The patient says, how are things different in my life now that I've been treated for cancer and I've had the side effects of cancer treatment? It's a totally different perspective. And the facts are there are permanent, untoward effects of cancer therapy. I'm not talking about transient neutropenia or transient nausea and vomiting that chemotherapy induces. I'm talking about permanent effects that affect quality of life that are termed collateral damage. Effects like chemo brain, effects like permanent paresthesias or permanent alopecia or permanent chronic fatigue. The American Cancer Society has pioneered the concept of survival research, survivorship research. But I think they have not gone far enough, far enough. Because see, the question that needs to be asked of a cancer patient is how is your life different now that you've had cancer and been treated for it compared to your life before? The kind of research that occurs under survivorship is researchers ask a question, certain perfunctory questions like, how's your sex life? How's your sleeping? It should be the researcher asking the question. The patient should be talking about how they've been impacted by the disease. So I think survivorship research uh, needs to be liberated. So the most important parameter in evaluating the impact of a new therapy are number and type of tumor responses. That statement is false. Age-adjusted survival, disease-free survival is much more important. But the most important thing of all is quality of life. So we're at our second and final question and answer period. Yes, sir. We got a person who's kind of a friend who we just had cancer surgery to be in the sinus area. In order to get to it, to cut it out, they go through the valve, they have to block off the eye because it's visible there. And so we're going to read make the system. It's asking us to read. So I was taking a look at the photon therapy for the next day's efforts. There's all kinds of radiology therapies. So you read all this stuff, and photon is type power to be really great because it localizes and focuses it, put it right in the tumor. And I'm kind of wondering what you think about that and what happens mechanistically with the photons as they get into it. They start knocking things around. Well, it sounds to me she has a type of head and neck cancer. Yes. Is she a smoker and a drinker? I don't think she smoked, and I don't think she was very Okay. Well, oral cancer and head and neck cancer is only increased now, even in non-smokers or drinkers. It all depends on the stage. Most of these tumors are squamous cell cancers, and it, and it depends on the stage. Some early stage, some T1 lesions can be treated with surgery alone. But if they show certain things under the microscope, like paraneural invasion or lymphovascular invasion, or they're close to a margin, then studies really have shown that there is a benefit from adjuvant radiation therapy and, and as well as adjuvant chemotherapy. You have one shot at it because if it recurs later in the head and neck, it's going to have a very poor prognosis and you're not going to have a good chance of cure. The, the chance of cure is in the initial staging. And so there are a number of radiotherapies. I think photon beam works as well as any. But the question is what is the stage and what are the features under the microscope that would make that therapy adjuvantly effective? Okay. I, yeah, I obviously don't know that. But Thank you. I was just curious if this was more and more of a magic bullet than the others to say. There are no magic bullets I in cancer. Thank I wish there were. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, do you see uh, gene modification therapies like CRISPR and other types uh, being a new type of improvement in cancer therapy? I'm very negative about gene therapy in cancer. Let me, let me tell you why. 
In medical school, I learned that single cell anemia was due to a single point mutation in the beta globin gene of hemoglobin. Single gene, single mutation. I learned this in, 19, in the 1970s. 40 years later, we can't treat sickle cell anemia. We can't reverse the effect of one gene. Now, cancer has many genes. Not every gene, as I said, maybe four or five genes. How can we possibly target the emperor of all maladies with, with a targeted gene therapy? In gene therapy, you need delivery, and you need to knock out almost every cancer cell because the cells that you have in him, they're going to grow back. So I'm very negative about gene therapy and cancer. I'm negative about gene therapy in general, except for certain congenital immunodeficiency states. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Could you comment on the status of the omics? There's genomics, there's metabolomics, there's proteomics, and then there's kind of the big data component of that. What, what, what's the status and potential <coughs> there? Well, they're all important because they're high throughput. You need a, a you need great computational ability to analyze genomics and metabolic uh, genomics and transcriptome and proteomics. These will contribute to precision medicine, especially when analyzing a tumor. But whether it'll lead to personalized medicine is another kettle of fish. And actually, Obama's moonshot is heavily based on computer analysis of these, of these databases. And they want to share the databases among scientists, which is a great, great thing. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, uh, sir. You know, to get uh, somebody uh, supposedly free of cancer and then you come in with the can the cancer vaccines, do you think that would increase survival of breast cancer? Well, that would fit into immunotherapy, right? And, and in, in addition to targeting this uh, PDL1, PD1 pathway. There are attempts, there are a number of phase one and phase two trials, taking a tumor out of the patient, purifying the tumor antigen, giving that in ex vivo with the dendritic cells which process the antigen, and sensitize uh, T lymphocytes with that. In fact, Pfizer is doing a trial in metastatic prostate cancer, exactly that. And fortunately, or I'm glad to report, they're doing it at Rosman University. So that's part of immunotherapy. I think it has promise, but again, I'm still faced with the idea that the creator didn't give us the ability to recognize this disease as foreign, and there is only minimal deviance between a cancer cell and a normal cell. Most of the thing is the same. It's not like a foreign organism, like a bacteria, where we, our immune system can recognize that, or we can vaccine against smallpox and other poxes. It's much harder to trick a tumor cell, or to get our body to recognize the tumor cell as foreign. Yes, sir. What about using uh, gene modification for embryos to uh, uh, prevent, reduce at least cancer rates in the future? You want to modify uh, a, a fertilized ovum? <coughs> or, yes. Uh, well, you know what? When I was a small boy, people talked about going to the next solar system and, and visiting the stars. I think that is not realistic to our children or our children's children. To modify an embryo without any deleterious effects just to prevent cancer, I think that's way, way in the future. Well, how about modifying just the DNA of, of each of the parents and then doing the vitro? Well, not everybody gets cancer, right? So you would be talking about a familial cancer uh, syndrome. And we have ways of screening patients if they have an inherited germline mutation. We can do things that are not very nice. We can prophylactically take out the breasts for patients or ovaries who are destined to get cancer. But I think to, you know, when you talk about modifying the genome, that's very difficult technically, and it raises a number of ethical issues in my mind. Any other questions? So we have, yes, sir. Uh, what kind of action plan do you think would work for improving the situation? Advocacy. 
We need to get 89135 to support this medical school. We need to get the philanthropy not sent to California. We need to get these funding agencies who receive a lot of money from the vets to send some of it back. You know, it's sort of the opposite, right? The strip is based on the, pre uh, the concept that people come here to gamble and they come here for entertainment and they leave their money here. When it comes to medicine and science, the opposite thing happens. The money leaves Nevada, and it never comes back. And it works to our detriment. Any other questions? So we have only one more. I really thought a lot of you would be wise. They would, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes ma'am. Is there any increase in incidence of cancer in autoimmune disease diagnosed patients? I have to think about that. You know, autoimmunity is the exact opposite, right, of failure of the immune system to recognize cancer. In fact, many of these immunotherapy effect, immunotherapy strategies, they have a side effect of autoimmunity. Patients who are treated with this PDL1 PD uh, drug, this antibody, they have a high rate of autoimmune disease because when the T cell is stimulated to attack the cancer cell or the inhibition which normally exists is removed, they attack other cells. And the same thing is true with sensitizes the immune system to a tumor antigen. Very few tumor antigens are unique to tumor cells. So autoimmunity is sort of the opposite side of the coin. Now, is there an autoimmune disease that has a predisposition for cancer? Probably. I think, I'm thinking of Fanconi's anemia. There are probably some other. But I, I think of the things as opposite. Any other questions? OK, so I, I was thinking that some people, like Bruce Morgenstern, would second guess me and know that if I put these nine statements, I had some angle on my sleeve. I thought for sure, though, everybody would, would say, cancer education and teaching at all levels would contribute to student as well as faculty satisfaction and happiness. How could this be false? Well, I'll prove it to you. <coughs> teaching, education, and the promulgation of knowledge make us happy? The answer to this question is given in common colloquialisms, in Greek mythology, in the New Testament, and in the Holy Scriptures. And the answer which is given is unequivocally no. We know the statement, ignorance, not knowledge, is the this. We know the story of Pandora's box, where curiosity unleashed all these ills to the world. And then we have the story of Prometheus. Prometheus, in Greek mythology, brought fire and warmth to a darkened earth. What happened to Prometheus? Zeus punished him. He chained him to a rock, and he had an eagle come down and eat out of his liver. And then we have the book of John, 832, where there's an elegant discussion of the meaning of truth and the search for truth. But there's no mention that the search of truth will make one happy. It simply says, if you seek the truth, the truth shall set you free. And then finally is the story of Adam and Eve, Genesis 3-4-6. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They didn't have a care in the world. They were happy as could be and content. And God said, listen, you can do anything you want, but don't eat from the tree of knowledge. And of course, they were induced by the serpent. They ate from the tree of knowledge. God didn't like that. He banished them from happiness. He banished them from paradise. He made Adam toil every day of his life, and he made Eve endure the hardship of childbirth. You see, education and knowledge and wisdom do not make us happy. They do the opposite. So this statement is also false. Now, having said that, I want you all to know that today, I'm very happy. <laughs> because I've had the privilege to talk to all of you in this great auditorium, in this outstanding building, and uh, in this uh, special university. When I think about this building and this auditorium, I'm reminded of the story of Masada. 
Some of you may know the story of Masada, some of you may not. Masada was a city. It was a fortress in ancient Israel. And it was the site of very good activities until an outside institution had designs on expansion. And that institution was the Roman Empire. And it conquered Israel. It destroyed the Holy Temple. And it surrounded Masada, where a band of heroic and brave Israeli soldiers held out for several years, even though they were surrounded. And they were, their food and their water supplies were compromised. And eventually, Masada fell. And after the Roman Empire itself withdrew, Masada was deserted. No one was lived there for centuries. But the story of Masada ha ends happily, because today Masada again belongs to the Jewish people in the state of Israel. Now this building and this campus reminds me of the story, because it was formed initially by two visionaries from Uranus. And they developed the Nevada Cancer Institute was an academic cancer center doing clinical trials and research. And it was designed by Nevadans, some Nevadans, and for Nevadans. But as fate would have it, it came upon hard times, and it fell. And another outside entity that had designs on expansion claimed it. And that was the University of California at San Diego. Of course, that didn't work out too well. And this building, like Masada, was abandoned for years, for two to three years. These rooms, these labs, these clinical spaces were gathering dust. But the story of this building and this campus also ends happily because two other visionaries, Doctors Rosenberg and Kaufman saw the wisdom of acquiring this. And today it stands again as an academic health care center for Nevadans, by Nevadans, and of Nevadans. And when Israeli soldiers are, when they join the army, they're brought to the base of Masada. And they're required to say this oath, Shainis Masada lo to poor. Solemn oath that I believe I who identify this building with this story, and those of us in this room who also feel a sense of commitment to Roseman University and this College of Medicine, and all those whose names are on these walls, and everybody afflicted or affected by cancer in one form or another, would hopefully join me as it applies to this university and this building and this room by saying, Masada must not fall again. Thank you. Again, any, any uh, questions or comments, uh, feel free to email me. I'll be glad to provide you with a, a copy of this talk. It's been my privilege to speak to you.